what ABN, Aina and Imran Ji have put together with me is something which all the people on this dais have been working silently in the morning years of their lives. I start with the first, the most celebrated, the most devoted, dedicated man behind this amalgamation of not just law but of society, Lord Diljit Rana. Now, Diljit means a winner of hearts. Dil means heart and Jeet means winner. He's a winner of hearts. He came as a teenager to Belfast, set up a momentous business empire, now runs a flourishing hotel industry and the cordial group of institutions and other things. Besides, in his hometown in the state of Punjab in India, he has a 30 acre campus where he goes four times a year and where he has provided every education facility from a school to a professional degree to people who have no access to education. This is a man who founded Gopio, global organization of people of Indian origin. I know all this by heart because I have been with him for almost three decades. His devotion, his dedication to bonding India with England has been very strong. We are only doing a minuscule part of that. Most of all, in troubled times, Lord Rana put his goodwill at stake and brokered a peace between the IRA and the British government on his dining table in 13 Milhoun Park, his residence, for which he was made a lord and for which the Indian government made him Honorary Council General of India. Despite little difficulties, I will not say bad health, despite little few mobilities, he is still very strong at heart. He is still willing to go and he especially flew in because we had an event yesterday and an event today. We have never done anything without him. And I remember my first book launch, our first book launch in, on 13th of April 2005 with Lord Gordon Slim. Lord Rana was the one who had put everything together. Now, we are only bringing in lawyers together. People like Lord Rana have been bringing Indians from India and rehabilitating them in Belfast. He has also been taking trade delegations from Ireland to India and telling them to invest in India. Now these are the people's people who are the builders of our foundation. What we are doing today is only reaping the harvest. So with this little description which I printed from my heart is what I think Lord Rana is. Next in seniority would be my tutor, Dr. Vera Mensi. When I came as a 25 year old to SOAS to do my masters, Dr. Vera Mensi was my personal tutor. And he taught me law and society in South Asia. He was one man who amalgamated South Asian students into the mainstream. He had a very big role because he's, he speaks just Hindi. He's a Sanskrit scholar. His PhD is on ceremonies of Hindu marriage. He's not a scholar of law, but he knows the rule of life. He knows what is society. He took over from a very exalted chair, the chair which Dr. John Duncan M. Derrick, the famous professor of Hindu law, left at SOAS. So he had a very big seat to occupy. But over the years, his writings, his books, his knowledge as an expert goes back with my connection with him for over 38 years. His better half, Nilima Devi Mensky, who is with us today, is a classical Indian Kathak dancer. She's an MBE. 
she comes from the marathi background and i first met them in vadodara in gujarat and that is how i came to england when i wanted to do an essay he made me move with her in his family house that was what is law and society in south asia and then i was living with my uncle in london he insisted that i move into a newly bought flat it changed my life and then he, he we started working together i started handling classes and i we worked together and and i i used to see him he was a perfect a uh, user of a perfect man when i finished my essay he said you'll never have any trouble to write because whatever i wrote he would tear it to pieces <laughs> and at that time in 1985 with a manual typewriter he typed my essay he said i am also learning i have now authored nine books that's thanks to him so this this is the second pillar in this room on the alliance which we have built then i move to the next pillar lord justice matthew thor lord justice matthew thor whom we heard yesterday he said i am not an academic i am not an administration but when he was in, in the rcj he donned the hat of the judge as of international family law this was a newly created position which the british government created for amalgamating different judicial systems for bringing out a coherent policy of relief where in his view a judge could pick up a telephone and ring another judge in a telephone i have a problem how do i deal with it that is the judicial network which lord thorp and luckily and happily i and my brother ranjit both llm samswas were ushered in not through the front door but through the back door as indian representatives because our judiciary was unrepresented so we had we saw the best in wilton park we saw the best in windsor we saw the best of conferences where the top legal brains in the world only talked about family law family law normally is a poor country cousin in national conference because there is one graveyard session somewhere in the end but these lord justice thought brought family law out from the coffin and gave it life he brought in judges he and i have been trying since 2000 for india to sign the hate convention we have not succeeded he asked me yesterday also uh, are we near it i said maybe next century possibly but he did a judicial protocol with pakistan on child abduction and he he trained japanese he trained a lot of countries and the the head chipped in william duncan hand and do and he made an immense contribution so what lord thorp created was carried on by justice moylan and then now justice mcdonald carries the flag forward so this is this is a very very important base which lord thorp has built for us we are only adding maybe a floor on the building and the immense contribution to international family law was enormous lord thorp still remains a dear friend age is not a barrier he still as fertile as he was on the bench and he is perhaps able to produce more in other disciplines of life may be hens laying eggs or maybe chai or maybe walking in the alps he's in a beautiful book on his uh, sojourn in life in that fact next i come to something which i was not aware of mr gopal subramanian the most celebrated lawyer in the indian legal system solicitor general chairman bar council international arbitrator handler of immense volume of work if you go through this profile on wikipedia it never ends i had a job consolidating the best part there are some chairs here please on this side please don't don't stand kindly now mr gopal subramanian 
was the one who made the professional bridges with England and is now permanently in three well-known buildings. And I now tell him that it's time that we have Gopal Supramanian Chambers because we have reached that stage of eminence where he, he needs to fly the Indian flag on his own independently. Now, we have, for all who do not know, we have recently in India amended the Bar Council regulations and we have permitted entry of foreign lawyers with certain restrictions. So we broke the ice after 60 years. We've been trying to start this process, but we never succeeded. Now, there also happened on 5th of June, an MOU, which the Bar Council of India and Wales and the Bar Council of India signed with the Bar Council together. And this has now allowed Indian lawyers to come into England and work without rights of appearance and vice versa meaning English lawyers can go to India and work without the right to practice. So officially, there is a two-way street now. Now, though this MOU was signed on 6th of June 2023, but it was fathered, mothered and procreated when Mr. Gopal Subramanian was the Solicitor General of India and the Chairman of the Bar Council. So on this short note, I think Mr. Gopal Subramanian's vision two or three years ago is what we are here today. And I think his wisdom, his thought process, his vision, his farsightedness, his planning of that you can never develop sitting in your own little island. We have to step out. We have to sign the conventions. Family law is not trade and commerce. I lose, I win. It's a question of lives. I think the aftermath of what Mr. Subramanian thought is what a brilliant mind like Aina has picked up. Aina and Imran. We met in April. And over the first meeting only, we brokered this system. And as and as we went by, we saw that things were falling into shape, which were cementing what we were proposing to do. And most fortunately, today, on the 13th of June, we are benefited by all of you and these eminent personalities who are here to bless our lives. I always never my parents and I always carry them with me in whatever I do. But I think these living institutions of society are the ones who created this thought process and let it go. So now I have given my introductory bit. Now I leave it to Aina because Aina wanted the house full before she wanted to start. So Aina, over to Aina. Thank you very much. I think I'll stand because you can all see me now at the back. Can you hear me? Hello, good evening and welcome everybody. Thank you, Anil Ji, for such a wonderful introduction and a, a, certainly a succinct summary, summary of, dare I say it, some centuries of experience all together on one table. So, why are we gathered here today? Um, twofold reasons, one is the ABLE, a cross-border alliance of lawyers launch in London, which has been planned for a long time, but small challenges like the pandemic had meant that we had to um, leave it until we were in person in London. And we wanted to, together with that launch, announce the opening up of borders in India, which means that we can have a reciprocal relationship, which can be a model for many other nations to follow. So it's very apposite that we are starting the India Desk with uh, being blessed by so many people who have spent decades working towards this goal. What is the aim of ABLE? Perhaps a lot of you will be wondering, um, and there are packs on your chair which will explain it in more detail, and our website, but the vision I had originally 
was that after decades of working with good people across the globe, the technology finally meant that we could start having reciprocal referrals which um, would benefit our clientele much more quickly than the past. It could be across time zones, it could be um, at uh, paperless vision would take place which would much um, speed up the access to justice that we'd had before. So for me it was really important to harness that technology and have global joined up thinking, which we've managed to do. So with our alliance, we do cover now over 70 countries. We are growing, so we're inviting people to apply for membership um, from other countries. It is about 250 plus experienced lawyers across the globe. So it tends to be peer to peer rather than junior lawyers. It tends to be people who are owner-led law firms. So they have the power of decision-making at the touch of a WhatsApp often, instead of going through committees and seeing what can be done in the future. It has at its center my speciality, which is family law, international family law, global families, Islamic law as a niche specialism, Asian cultural aspects like dowries, um, in-laws, in uh, owning property, businesses, etc. intrinsically with the family units. So you can't split a couple without splitting the whole extended family. So there are many um, commonalities in the, what we used to call the Indian subcontinent across faiths, across cultures. Using that as a paradigm, it, we found the same was happening amongst Arab families, African families, many, many families that are not in just Europe, but across the globe. So if we look at that, what are we finding as a challenge as lawyers? It's not just family law. It could be that I'm asked to recommend somebody to solve an inheritance dispute. Somebody's left, you know, sometimes over a billion pounds, which can't be claimed by the family because they're scattered in about six different countries. We can't trace many of the beneficiaries. We can't trace the money of the assets or they've been gobbled up by the uncles who are local. So there are so many areas where it's, uh, a network like this would be helpful. So for you to take away a few points today, not just family law, although that's a vast area as Anil G has said by itself and all aspects of family law, inheritance, family um, companies, structures as in um, family trusts for property, tracing assets abroad, tracing um, people abroad, <coughs> husbands have disappeared offshore. Uh, we've worked with the Serious Fraud Office, the National Crime Agency, I thank you for attending. Um, we've worked with, um, this is serious crime only, we're not talking about small crime, but really serious crime worth multi-millions. So wherever you can help access to justice, I want you to think now you have a band of brothers and sisters who have at their heart speedy justice, which they can actually sometimes summon up in a quick phone call rather than emails. They will do that for you because there's a trust being built up and we will help each other. So if you have a family like I had, I'll give you an example where the husband start comes and looks in Singapore, can't find any lawyer who can help him. He's now moved to Indonesia. His wife has started the divorce in England because it's a UK um, home. The children are in a Middle East country because I don't want to give too much away. They've got properties in Hungary, uh, Poland, and many places where they move together. So I'm talking about nine jurisdictions straight away. They all want to be seized off it, so who's going to file the divorce first and where? Who's going to gather the assets in? How are we going to do that so that the children do not suffer and the family doesn't suffer and we heal as we go along? So these are challenging aspects that we need to work on together. I also want you to think in terms of expert reports. We often get asked to recommend experts who are at the peak of their profession, not just with their legal knowledge, but the biggest challenge for judges is that, is that expert report actually worth anything? Does it mean anything in, in reality? 
Is it just from the lifted from the textbook, or is it being able to bring access to justice for that uh, family, let's say, today? Is that law actually being applied? We don't talk about theory, we talk about practice. We work with expert lawyers who can get the job done. So it will mean that there will be a, we will be hearing later with the technology that's now available to collect expert reports at a touch of a button and enable you all at whatever levels you are, you know, legal aid to medium net worth to high net worth to uber high net worth, be able to get meaningful expert reports. We also now talk about um, sectors other than families, not just um, family law and inheritance, but commercial work, business migration, and many other aspects that now are growing much more quickly than they ever have done before, and there's potential for massive growth globally. So on that note, I would like you to, um, all of you, join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers. And Luigi, may I leave it to you to yes. introduce each person? I hope you will welcome the Alliance. I hope you will ask how to join, what the criteria is, and all of your friends and trusted advisors globally that you would like to align with us, I welcome them also to come on board. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ayana, for the wonderful, uh, passionate and uh, spoken from the heart address, which is probably like you in me also. It's in my head and it's in my heart and it flows out because what we see every day is a new problem. An abandoned baby born to a Tibetan woman and an English man. A child born, born out of a same-sex relationship and transported to Goa. A parallel divorce in the Netherlands and in India. A child abduction litigation in the US and in India with an anti-injunction suit. I can go on with the marvels of examples. Human relationships from Indians are very complex. For the reason we are 1.3 billion and 30 million of us live abroad in about over 100 countries. So the complex relationships we form when we cross borders, when we marry, when we procreate and we decide to choose one jurisdiction makes things complicated. The problem comes because majority of the Asians or let us say Indians are Hindus by religion. So our personal law goes with us as a backpack. It has extraterritorial application. Most European jurisdictions take cognizance of you by lex loci, law of domicile. They say you live here, so our law applies to you. So then starts a tug of war. So you, if you take a divorce of a Hindu marriage anywhere in Europe or in England, you are divorced, but you are married in India. These are what was described by the Supreme Court in 1975 in Satya versus Tita as limping marriages. But law has to come to an, uh, an able end to resolve the issue. We do not recognize a retributive breakdown of marriage. So how do you divorce? Divorce is important in India. Why? Because if you remarry, it's bigamy and bigamy is a criminal offense. Then you also have to resolve child custody. You have to resolve matrimonial property. And most of all, you have to get rid of matrimonial cruelty, criminal cases, domestic violence cases, custody matters, or simply a maintenance dispute. So if I am available as an expert, I have to offer to you as a barrister or a solicitor, a package deal, which means how can we permanently sever the relationship as peacefully as possible. So we reduce the foreign divorce decree into an MOU and we do a mutual consent divorce whereby all the English decree or the foreign decree becomes a part of a settlement and we can bury the hatchet. So these kind of disputes 
are very important to resolve because until and unless the matter is resolved, this this doesn't take you anywhere. Now, starting with this, in my last book, I Global Indian and the Law, I was able to cull out after 35 years seven sections in which I think global cross-border views are very necessary. The first is nationality and citizenship. We as a country do not allow dual citizenship. So, and if an Indian gives up his citizenship, it's never given back to him. So what if a child is born to an American couple of Indian origin in India? I had this issue once. The child is stateless. If the mother says, I'm not going back to the US, the child is stateless. So what do you do? An American passport. But if the mother is not willing to let the child go, you have to fight right up to the Supreme Court. I fought two rounds, it took three years, and it cost the man a hefty sum of money. But then this issue had to be resolved. Then comes marriage and divorce. A brief idea of what I have given you. It's a very complex situation because we follow the fault principle. If, sorry, we follow the we, yes, we follow the fault principle and we do not believe in, believe in the breakdown principle. So we have to prove adultery, cruelty, desertion. Until we do that, the marriage is a marriage. Then comes maintenance in matrimonial matters. Now this has become a very heavily litigated area among Asians who migrated from India in the 60s. They are now very high in net worth individuals and with 30 to 40 years of marriage, they want a divorce. Now how do you divide assets in England? How do you divide assets in India and in other jurisdictions? It's a 50-50 division in most European and English jurisdictions. But in India, it is a need-based law. And everything which was earned during the marriage doesn't go into the kitty. Whatever is self-acquired, whatever is business-acquired, whatever is HUF, is goes, goes separate. So this is a complex situation which needs to be resolved. Then comes child custody, guardianship and adoption. Now this is a very complex area. In India, we follow the Guardian and Wards Act of 1890. It talks of singular custody and we are not a signatory to the Hague Convention. So this makes the pot boiling all the time. For a parent who has fought with his spouse, all he has to do, do is pick up the child, pick up the passport and come to India and start dating it. I have started working on a mirror order principle of mirroring Indian orders and trying to send children back, but we are still very slow. Lord Thorpe and I have been working on it, as I told you, for a very, very long time. But we are still in a very complex situation. Then comes a very grey area, surrogacy. I have two of my books over it. We started surrogacy in 1995 and we let it go on to 2012. It is a multi-billion dollar industry now. But the government in its wisdom in 2023 has wiped it out. Where will it go? I don't know. But a fallout of what surrogacy can do, it was seen in Ukraine. Over a thousand babies were born. Ukraine had a free surrogacy policy. But when the war broke out, the children could not be claimed because the genetic test is required for the child to go out. So these babies were abandoned in good hours. I don't know what became of them. Now, it is time that an institution like The Hague looks at an international policy on surrogacy for for strange situations like this. Then next we come to overseas Indian succession issues. A lot of Indians have properties in India. Do you make a two, do you make two wills? Do you make one will? We do not have inheritance tax. In England there is a very heavy high inheritance tax. How do we get away to pay it? Unless an English lawyer and a lawyer from India talk to each other, you cannot resolve it. Then comes the latest fashionable litigation, conflict of jurisdiction and anti-suit injunctions, which was a purely commercial proposition on forum convenience principle. But now it has become very popular and trendy. You want to stop somebody from pursuing the litigation when the husband and wife are already in litigation before them in another country. Now, for all this, 
to work, we need a triangle. If you as a foreign lawyer need an opinion or an institution needs an advice, it's lost. For example, the latest matter which I have had in the child of two foreign parents of the same sex being lifted to go, nobody knew what to do. So this is where aliens in their desk comes to your rescue. KBL provides you the professional expertise, lets you retain the contact and assures you that the service which you will be providing in India or anywhere else will be of very good stature and the result being produced will be channelized back to you after having been done. So this organization or this mechanism of putting the whole thing together particularly with the legal doors having been opened and people will be able to get work visas and do all this officially, I think is something which Mr. Gopal Subramanian's vision to start with was, was marvelous. So with this very brief introduction, I will now request Mr. Gopal Subramanian to please take the floor and uh, kindly thank you very much thank you very much Anil. and uh, thank you also I know uh, I'm overwhelmed by sitting amongst three giants one is, of course, Lord Rana, uh, whose journey to Northern Ireland and what he has achieved is simply incredible. Uh, it's, it's more than three lifetimes of experiences. Then we have the Right Honourable Sir Matthew Thorpe. Uh, years of experience, years of distillation of wisdom, and above all, a deep understanding of the human psyche. I, of course, had heard of Professor Duncan Derrick. I was a great admirer of his, and what an honor to sit with his successor by my side. I think it's a bit too much, really. And I am overwhelmed. <laughs> Having said that, uh, I have to say that the initiative for cross-border alliances in the legal profession is very, very ripe. Uh, it is not only from a comparativist standpoint that it is necessary. Uh, India is a comparativist jurisdiction. India looks at the evolution of law in other jurisdictions as a part of its doctrine of precedent. So India, uh, while being conscious of uh, local situational differentiations always acknowledges the weight of jurisprudence of other countries. That is one aspect. But the second aspect, which I think is of very great importance, is that we are dealing with human situations. We are dealing with marriage and the meaning of marriage itself has evolved over a period of time, uh, from the time it was treated as a, a, a facet of ownership over a woman-like property. Uh, and uh, 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 we have moved far, far away from it. So in spite of the fact that patriarchy was very evident in many parts of the world, we today have moved away from it. We think that there is a sense of equality, equity, and there is some degree of uh, uh, partability in human affairs and human assets, which must be respected by processes known to law. And uh, we have amidst our presence uh, 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 Dr. Mensky, who is a great scholar of Sanskrit. And uh, this should tell you also something about uh, uh, the nature of 
uh, Indian personal law. The Hindu law, which is the personal law, has always been founded to some extent definitely on core religious and possibly spiritual principles. Many of them have to be cross-referenced to Sanskrit texts. So in the tradition of Max Muller, Sir John Woodrow, Duncan Derrett, we have Dr. Mensky here, and I'm sure you're going to hear him uh, expound not only the nuances in respect of Hindu law as personal law, and you also have the position under the Muslim law. Uh, and again, uh, we have this constant tension between uh, uh, moving towards a uniform civil code, because in some sense we have a law which treats marriages like a civil union. We have Special Marriages Act as well. So we have a bundle of these laws. But the point which I think Anil made very perceptively is the human situation gets completely threatened and fragmented when there is going to be a divorce. A divorce is certainly a, a rupture in a relationship which parties or individuals intended for a long time. And now we are talking only about the traditional kind of relationships here. We are talking about a man and a woman. Although, at the moment in India, there is a considerable debate and a pleading before a court to say that even same-sex marriages ought to be legalized and must be treated as uh, genuine uh, associations which are capable of being given sanctity as has been done in many jurisdictions including England. But these are all matters of considerable uh, uh, tension and uh, when we come to businesses, when we come to inheritance, when we come to division of assets and shall we say the execution of testamentary instruments, I think we are really oscillating between this world and another world it does clearly require uh, multiple uh, jurisdictional uh, competencies to come together and iron out a, a solution. Uh, this is really something which has been possible. And that too in the field of family law, because family law, as all of you know, has not been ever treated with the degree of reverence which it was entitled to because of the overarching commercial superiority of commercial law, contract law. But in England, family law has now acquired a very nuanced and a very important position. And thanks to some of the most wonderful people in the legal profession like Aina and wonderful judges like Brenda Hale, who made it a point to declare that there was a point which had to be heard as far as women in England were concerned uh, in relation to matters of family. Then we have children. What about children? What is their fault? What is their, uh, uh, what is their sense of culpability? How do you make them culpable? How do you make them suffer? Then you have, I mean, I just now read a brilliant speech by Lord Peter Jackson who said that uh, there is a certain degree of principle flexibility which you do need, which judges need to exercise in matters relating to children, in matters relating to family matters. It's not unfettered discretion and it's not strict rules either. You have to actually follow very carefully uh, a midway path. But these are all challenges. And the fact that Aina and Anil have made this effort to, uh, to, to cross the barriers. And this is a very important statement. It is not only humanistically very important for jurisdictions. It is professionally very important. But most important is that it opens the windows of opportunity and growth. Growth is never by exclusion. Growth is always by inclusion. And nobody actually is a loser when there is inclusion. It is only when you have the other or when you have this attitude of exclusion that society 
uh, is impacted. And the impact on society is a long-term impact. It is so negative that uh, you can never assess, uh, like, let us say, like climate damage or environmental damage. Pathi Sarthi Dasgupta is a brilliant man, the first economist who said GDP is not what it sounds. You've got to minus what is attributable to environmental damage. So I think this alliance needs everybody's support, their best wishes, and a certain sense of belonging, a sense of commitment, and shall we say, uh, it, is our, it is our duty to further such efforts in, in the right direction. Because all said and done, uh, human beings are human beings. They are universally uh, the same. And uh, I think as long as we have the Declaration of Human Rights, which again has got important components respecting personal law, and status of the person and dignity of the individual, it's very necessary uh, to work together. And thank you, Anil, for this magnificent opportunity. Uh, and as I said, uh, I, I've tried to uh, put up a brave front, yes. but uh, all said and done, I'm deeply overwhelmed by the evidence uh, on both my sides on this table. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this excellent explanation of diversity, as I would put it. Learning by crossing borders is something we have seen in my own family. I came 38 years ago to Swas and to Dr. Mensky to learn. What he taught me, what he put in me, went in me, and it has now been passed on to my son who has, after 38 years, joined the same very college source in the same very University of London and on a Felix scholarship. I came after my father mortgaged our house to raise a loan to come from here to come here. But the benefit of traveling, the benefit of learning has now passed on to the second generation of my family and our parents bless us by being here. One that my daughter is a solicitor with Alan and Nobi, and my son is in the lap of Soas, whose cradle was always swung by people like Dr. Mensky. Now, coming a little away to law, and to add to what Mr. Gopal Subramaniam said, family law is spurting and emerging from a volcano which was dormant. Our nine judge Supreme Court bench says right to privacy is a fundamental right. Right to life has been expounded in, from the Indian Constitution and it has gone to say my right to cohabit, my right to procreate, my right to marry is my right to life and it is a fundamental right under the Constitution of India. So this is where the thinking is going. And in India, in the real jurisdiction, in parents betray, we do a lot of things. So this was just to add to what a brilliant explanation of Indian system which Mr. Kupal Sabhagavad Now, I would like to switch away from law and come to life. Lord Rama has a PhD from the University of Life. And I would request Lord Rana to share some of his interesting experiences and what all he did to make England and to make Ireland a place for freedom, not with guns shooting and bombs blowing up buildings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Anandji, for your... Sir, please press the button. Kindness. I don't think I deserve all the praise that has been. I don't think I deserve all the praise that you've been giving me. I came from India in May 63, just about 60 years now. England was a different place at that time. There was nobody talking about equality 
human rights and uh, diversity. So I have a very disappointing <coughs> time. A couple of my friends who are living in Belfast, so I came to them in August 66. And Northern Ireland was a different place. There were very few Indians. They were like an extended family. They were all in business or self-employed. So they persuaded me to come to Northern Ireland. It was a very promising place, February of 66, and uh, I bought a restaurant. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an educationist, so all I could do was think how to make a living for my family. And uh, we did quite well. Then the civil rights movement started in Northern Ireland. This was in 67. It started from graduates who were just qualified from <coughs> Queen, Queen University, Belfast. Belfast and Northern Ireland didn't have equal rights. In local government elections, some people have eight, nine, ten votes, others have none. So the original protest was only about civil rights, that each person has equal rights. Northern Ireland was created like Pakistan was created by partitioning Ireland. Partitioning on the basis of majority of protestants in Northern Ireland the rest of Ireland was Roman Catholic and Republican. So the idea of dividing was not a good idea. And the Protestant majority in Northern Ireland had a single-handed monopoly in government. The uh, population was maybe 60, 40 split, but uh, Catholics didn't get many assembly seats. They called Northern Ireland Parliament at that time. And what we call First Minister or Chief Minister was the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. So it's a long history, unfairness, and then resorting to violence. I have to say that violence sometimes starts from the government side administration. So had uh, somebody said, let's talk about equal rights, all that would happen in 35 years, killing, bombing, shooting, would have been <coughs> So I, in 71, I had four restaurants, two of them bombed, bombed within four weeks of each other. Belfast became a ghost town, hardly anybody was in Belfast after six o'clock. People came for their job, whether shopkeepers, employees, but after six o'clock when the shops closed, offices closed, it was really a ghost town. So my restaurants finished. It was a difficult time. And uh, I started fashion business, boutiques, anything to make a living. Uh, but during those years, my businesses were affected 23 times. I had multiple businesses, 
restaurants, boutiques, property, then hotels. So I have seen car bombs blowing up my hotel and my friends. So it was a difficult time. And there was always some hope that uh, some negotiations are going on, the problem will be resolved, but it lingered on. <clears throat> then about 80 at its peak, uh, Margaret Thatcher, she was a Prime Minister, but she had a bitter experience with IRA planting bombs in the Conservative Party conference hotel in Brighton. A couple of people got badly injured. So she turned against anything about Northern Ireland. So I had a vested interest to do something about it. I was prominent in the business community in Northern Ireland. So we started thinking what to do. Took advice from a political advisor to the Secretary of State, Tom King at that time. And he suggested that I invite people for dinner at my home. So this is how my involvement, trying to solve the problem, started uh, and first it was Tom King himself, Secretary of State, because the Republicans were against the government, but also at that time, Protestant Unionists were also turned against the government. Maggie Thatcher, the then Prime Minister, signed the Anglo-Irish Anglo Accord with the Republic of Ireland, the Unionists felt that they had not been sufficiently consulted about it. So they also said that passage no. Everywhere along the city hall streets, that passage no, no to a no Irish report. So, Tom King, when he went as Secretary of State, he was facing <coughs> kind of hostile attitude from the Unionists as well as from the Republicans. So I invited Tom King, Lord Mayor of Belfast, few other business committee people, and that broke the ice within the Protestant Unionists and the administration, Tom King's administration, <coughs> which encouraged us to do more of the South. So every so often, every six weeks, two months, uh, this political advisor, John O'Connor, would advise me or give me a list who to invite. And I simply invited them. It gave them opportunity to have a dialogue with each other. Just softly, softly approach, which I repeated for the next two, three years. By that time, then the church leaders got to know what I was doing, and they did the same. Other community leaders, the CBI Northern Ireland, Confederation of Industry. They got in touch with IBEC, which is the Irish uh, <coughs> Irish Business Community Leadership. So IBEC and CBI would have joined <coughs> in Belfast. So there were little things happening, but I was the first to encourage. So it's a long history.
Now, uh, Good Friday came and we celebrated 25 years. Uh, Joe Biden, the president, came to Belfast. Other VIPs. So the problem is resolved in a way, but not open. We still have what they call Northern Ireland Protocol. <clears throat> One of the deeds that the Good Friday Agreement the Republicans wanted them for, that there be never a physical border on the island. So with Brexit, then that became a problem. So now the border between Northern Ireland and United Kingdom is in the sea. <laughs> so this is not acceptable to the unionist politicians. So at least we uh, have achieved peace. The lesson to be learned are many from that experience. One that everybody, if you give them respect, give them a hearing, then they are willing to listen, willing to talk. The settlement that happened, Good Friday Agreement, did both. It, uh, the unionists made a compromise effort that they sat <coughs> with the higher Republicans, which was unthinkable. The Irish government, even though the partition happened in 1921, had not accepted the partition. So in their constitution, Ireland was all one. So they didn't accept the partition. But Good Friday Agreement, then they accepted the existence of Northern Ireland. The other is that in most situations like that, the, the government of authorities will say, surrender your arms before you take a seat at the table. In Northern Ireland, that was a lot. The government, the British government, accepted IRA keeping their arms and negotiating. Even when negotiations completed, they were not asked to disclose where the arm dump was. So IRA accepted and promised that they will decommission their own weapons themselves without disclosing to the other side. So there are many things which are unique in that. Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, there is no majority, no minority. Each party has a representation in the government according to the number of members they have. So it's like four or five headed being at the base one. So it's a unique example. So I won't take much of your time. But uh, any of you, if you come to the other round, give me a call or meet me. <coughs> Unlike some of the local <coughs> politicians who were keen to what went on and still active. But the message, main achievement <coughs> is that both sides agreed not to use violence for the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for this excellent lesson of life. What you have told us teaches us